There's a stereotype of scientists. They're male, and they're boring, and they're awkward. I'm obviously not that type. My name is Dr. Sierra Sibbles. Gitanjali Rao. Dr. Jessica Taff. Jayashree Sage. I'm a scientist at 3M. A scientist is anybody, and it shouldn't be based on age, race, or gender. Wherever we go. No dream is too big. If you inspire a girl and show her the different ways that she can do what she loves, she can change the world. Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Heather Long, an economics correspondent here at The Post. And today we're talking about women in tech with three women who have blazed their way to the top of tech companies, which unfortunately is still a very rare occurrence. And a little bit later in the program, we'll be speaking with Stacey Brown Philpott, the former CEO of TaskRabbit, and Jenny Rometty, the former CEO of IBM. But right now, we are pleased to welcome Ruth Porat, CFO of Google and Alphabet. Welcome to Post Live, Ruth. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So Ruth, I want to start back at the beginning of your career. In 1987, you joined Morgan Stanley, famously right before that Black Friday with stocks tanking. And basically, we've been talking about the need to get more women to the top in business for 30 years now. What do you say is still the biggest challenge holding women back from achieving those heights? Well, so I think that the, the good news is things have changed meaningfully since those early days in 1987. And, you know, I so I'm filled with both optimism and a clear sense of impatience. I think your question is spot on. Why not faster? And if I just take you back for a minute to 87, I remember in those early days, I was in a group where the, the privilege in that group was you got to meet with CEOs and present ideas, even at a young age. And one of the earliest encounters I had was um, I was told that the meeting was going to be at a male only lunch club. And I don't know why I had the courage to do this, but I went to my boss and said, if I physically can't be there, I don't want the product of my brain there. And what was a surprise and gratifying to me is he agreed. He called the partner who had set up the meeting, who was mortified because he had never invited a woman to present because there were so few of us. And he immediately changed the venue. Fast forward to today, I think those kinds of conversations were too few and far between. We didn't have tone from the top. We didn't have the processes and systems around things like pay equity, looking at performance reviews, clarity and a real deliberate approach to succession planning. We didn't have terms like allyship. It, it, this, we need everyone involved in looking for opt to promote women. So I think we're dealing with societal headwinds. It's taking time to bust through them. But with this kind of deliberate approach, I remain optimistic that we're gonna continue to see progress. And at Google, what we're focused on, what do we do internally and how can we support the broader environment to really create a bigger pipeline? Yeah, it's no more men only lunches. That's something. Um, so what I always ask when I see leaders who are concerned about these issues is, do we really need, do companies need to set concrete targets? I hate to use the word quota that's so loaded, but does there actually have to be a concrete number to see progress? And obviously your company, Google, recently announced last uh, summer, I think, that you wanted to see 30% more leaders from underrepresented groups by 2025. So a pretty ambitious and specific target. Do you think that's necessary to make the progress? I do, but I think it's part of an overall program. It's nice to set a goal, but if you then don't have the 
consistent follow through. So every other week we have our head of diversity come in with Google leads and we look at what's the data, what are we looking at for hiring, retention, we talk about succession planning. And that's why I say you need tone from the top and then real rigor, the scaffolding, the processes and systems. So yes, if you don't have transparency, it makes it easy not to have accountability. If you don't have some sort of a Northern star, where do you want to get? It's harder to know if you're making progress around it, but then you need to have the steps along the way. Yeah, that's really interesting that you're having so frequent meetings about it. Can you give us any updates on the progress towards that goal? I know we're barely a year in, but is, it, is are you seeing progress now? And what specific, um, are there any penalties for managers who aren't making these targets? So I, I would go back to really your first question. Yes, we're seeing progress, and I think all of us would say it's too slow here and you know broadly. And so you can see it in our transparency reports. We disclose data. I think that it's a best practice for every company to do so, again, because it really focuses what's the discussion uh, internally and externally. And we are looking at, at what are the uh, holding people accountable for uh, for progress. So obviously you've been at the top on both Wall Street and in Silicon Valley. You're always asked for your advice, but I'm wondering, do you give different advice to women uh, who want to make it to the top of Wall Street versus Silicon Valley? Is it a little bit different? It's not. I mean, if I reflect on what has been most valuable for me in my career, I keep coming back to sort of four four things that in as I look back on what I've done so far have been super helpful. You know, the first is stay curious, keep learning. If you feel like you're starting to plateau, go to someone you respect and say, what's my highest and best use and look for new opportunities and take risk. The second is make sure you're asking the right person. You know, you got to be working for the right boss. Have somebody in my earliest days, I there wasn't the word sponsor, but work for somebody who's somebody who's going to invest in you. My best opportunities actually I got there with help from and uh, advice from sponsors. You know, th the third is have a point of view. Uh, make your point of view known and, it, you know, anchor it in data. It becomes irrefutable when you anchor it in data. And then finally, make sure you're thinking about your life holistically. I don't believe in work-life balance, but I do think mix is important because it just energizes all of us. And I think those principles are true in finance. They're true in tech. They've certainly been my guiding principles. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, so I, I want to ask you about a little bit tougher subject, and as you know, there's a class action lawsuit against Google for former female employees uh, who say that they were not paid fairly, and this comes on the heels a few years before of a Labor Department investigation where the U.S. government did cite systematic compensation disparities against women at Google. Uh, obviously, you're the CFO. You are very concerned about these issues. How can you, are you assuring women today at Google that they are being paid fairly? Yeah, so we, we care immensely about this and ensuring we have equal opportunity and every element around it for women and underrepresented groups broadly. I think one of the most important innovations really at Google well before I got here was a systematic approach to pay equity where you go in af after the process and just an ensure with data analytics and um, you know, very focused work, that bias hasn't crept in. There's no question there continues to be bias in society and there's unconscious bias and even, you know, and, and it by, by definition of it's unconscious bias, people don't know they're doing it. And so we have systems and process that go in to make sure that we're correcting for it, uh, but care immensely about making sure we're getting this right. So are you confident today that that is no longer an issue at Google? I, I think that with the systems and process that we have in place, we're doing everything we can to make sure that we're doing the right thing and that there's equitable pay and that we're, you know, it's, it is a, a core priority for us, yes. Uh, obviously, Google recently announced a, uh, I believe it's $7 billion investment in, in the U.S. and in new office and data centers that could create 10,000 or more jobs. Uh, I'm curious, we've heard from a lot of CEOs that it's hard to hire right now. Are you all finding it hard to find employees to fill these roles? 
Well, so th that number is actually just across the U.S. and we're really excited about it because one of the elements of those $7 billion in, in 10,000 jobs is we're increasing the number of sites that we have, in particular sites where there's a lot of um, uh, diverse talent. So Atlanta, Chicago, New York, D.C., and really broadening out what we're doing to be the most attractive place for people generally. We've had you know, over a million applicants every year for a much smaller number of jobs. And so, you know, we continue to be a magnet for talent. I think one of the very important elements when we think about return to office and what each of us in these positions are trying to think through what continues to be really exciting for employees. And we're looking at how to evolve the way we think about what is the work, the structure of work going forward. So yes, I, I'm pleased to say we continue to be a great magnet for great talent. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to hear, you surprised a lot of people a decade ago when you made a comment that the wealthy can afford to pay more in taxes. Uh, obviously, there's a very concrete proposal on the table from President Biden to increase taxes on the wealthy. Do you still have that view and, and are you supportive of the president's efforts? Yeah, the the point I made back then is I very much hold, which is to have sustainable growth, it needs to be inclusive growth, and we each need to do our part. And I think that's true across the board in everything we do as leaders of companies. And, and you know, I was speaking individually at the time. I feel that same way uh, now as an individual. But I think that it goes really back to the point that to have sustainable growth, which is positive for everyone, it needs to be inclusive growth and we need to do our part. And you said recently that you were supportive of the global minimum tax that Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has been putting forward to try to get agreement with countries around the world at the OECD on a tax that could be applied to all different companies, particularly tech. Um, I, I'm curious, do you also support her push for the 28% corporate tax rate, raising that rate from 21 to 28? Do you, or do you have some concerns about going that high? You know, I, I, I think they've throttled that back in some of their comments that it's probably more likely to land in the 25% zone. I think that, again, trying, it, as we look at the intent behind it, the focus is how do we deliver an infrastructure program that this country needs and how do we fund an infrastructure program that this country needs and we're committed here to again playing our part in that. Um, Google is already one of the largest taxpayers in the U.S. Uh, we actually are paying taxes in line with the OECD average and um, have been you know, very committed to, to again, get doing that the right way. We brought our, our uh, international IP back to the US a couple of years ago, so we've got a good structure, but very much supportive of the OECD. We think that it creates a sustainable solution and supportive of ensuring we're doing the right things across the US. Another big issue that's probably landing on your plate again, obviously the European Union just this week is opening a, another formal antitrust investigation uh, claiming that Google is abusing its leadership role in advertising technology. Um, any, uh, can you give us any insight into you know, how Google sees those accusations and might respond? So scrutiny isn't new for us, and we've been very focused on engaging constructively with regulators. I think our main point is that people come to Google because they want to, not because they have to. People use our products and services, um, advertisers, because they want to, not because they have to. And so, you know, to us, the most valuable thing we can do is engage, continue to engage constructively with regulators to ensure that we're trying to help land things as, as they uh, deem important. Uh, one of our one of my colleagues who follows your company had, had uh, asked me, you know, Google, when he listens to Google executives talk that many of you downplay the import, importance of the display ad business. And so he's wondering, why don't you just sell it or spin it off if it keeps coming up as this antitrust issue over and over again? Well, I think it goes back to my prior comment, which is we believe that what we're able to offer advertisers and the products and services that we deliver for users um, are really valuable. And so I, I, we're we're engaging in why is there utility for everyone? That's in our view, the, the most appropriate step 
at this point. Uh, I want to ask you about innovation. Google is now such a huge company. You're obviously about to bring on thousands of employees more. And obviously, as you grow bigger and bigger, it, it can be hard to feel, still have that startup feel, still have that innovative feel that really drove the company in its early years. And um, there have obviously been some headlines in recent days about some employees at the company who feel that it's lost a bit of that that innovative soul that, that was so attractive when they first joined. Um, how do you think about that? How can What can you do with your team to really keep that spirit of innovation going? I think innovation is the lifeblood of what this company is. And we continue to be extremely focused on it. When I look at and, and talk about what is my approach to capital allocation, the number one thing is to continuing to invest in long-term opportunities. We then have, let's make sure we're focused in the right way and so that we can support and lean into those aggressively and let's make sure we're investing in operational excellence so we can protect the entire ecosystem but at the heart of it it's about innovation and recently at our developers conference Sundar said that one of our biggest moonshots is still search there's so much to do to make the experience continue need to improve for people and um, at, the, at, at the kind of the root of all of it is all of our investments in AI and the way that's delivering better experiences for users and for businesses. Everything from learn how to speak English on Google Translate or travel the world and be able to do so. Be, the innovations in, in what are we doing with photography and your ability to search the innovations in AI that as an example, one thing near to my heart as a two-time breast cancer survivor, our AI team has come up with a breakthrough in early detection of metastatic breast cancer. It's the work we're doing in sustainability. We have the most um, efficient data centers on the planet, and yet with AI, we were able to reduce our energy consumption. So I am seeing it all across Google and Alphabet and really excited about what it means. And most importantly, I think as leaders, if you are not investing in what, you know, kind of out there in the future, you're, you're starting to actually sow the seeds of your own destruction. So the ethos that, of course, we want to continue taking smart risk and, and support innovation and teams focused on innovation continues to be a key to what we do. Um. One of the areas people know you so well as a Wall Street leader and now as a tech leader, but you've also uh, played a pretty big role in helping shape government policy in 2008 in the midst of the financial crisis that this country was going through. I I'm wondering, we've obviously just been through an even worse uh, economic crisis in the past year. Um, what, what do you think the government did well this time? And, and what, you know, what lessons do we need to take away for next time that could have been better? Yeah, I think back on that a lot, not only what government leaders could do, but each of us as um, leaders of, of businesses. I think some of the key lessons from back in 08, many of which were applied this time, is in a crisis, there you only have poor choices. And so you need to move quickly and it's about least worst option. One of the things Secretary Paulson said back then was too often uh, you need to have the will and the means and too often by the time you have the will, you no longer have the means, which means you need to go all in early. And it also, the other element that I saw very clearly from 08 is you need a team that's been through a crisis before and has lateral vision because in a crisis, facts aren't clear and you're trying to piece things together so that you essentially have a tapestry with all of these disparate points, none of which alone tells you the story. And I think what worked really well back then was a strong team that moved and moved quickly. I feel like we've certainly, it's been exciting to see coming out of this year, the strength around the COVID response effort that, that Jeff Science has been leading. The coordinated approach has been key. It's that lateral vision weaving together what's going ac across uh, the, the states. And those kinds of lessons are important. This will not sadly be the last pandemic we have. So season team, know your source of vulnerability, protect against it, move quickly, move aggressively. Those are the lessons. I think what has been very positive is throwing a lot of liquidity into the market you know, we were very, I was very concerned, as many were at the outset, as to how, how deep could this go. And so the ongoing support, in particular for small, medium businesses, the most marginalized has been key. Yeah. What about the execution? I mean, a lot of these 
uh, state governments or, or uh, regional hubs for the Small Business Administration just didn't have the technology set up to get that money out the door through unemployment benefits or in the early days of those small business grants. And uh, is there some uh, takeaways that you have as a tech executive who also knows how hard it is to do these government programs in a crisis? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I'm actually very gratified to see the focus of the administration on renovating its technology infrastructure. One of the things we saw at Google as we pivoted early to work with states, cities, and the federal government, how can you support um, their needs at a time when they actually don't have the people on site because they're trying to protect their people. So as an example, one of the big things that was a surge, not just for the government, but for businesses as well, is this inflow of calls. Everything's moved, you know, digital, but inflow of how, where do I get disbursements, unemployment payments, all the things that you said. And so we've been implementing what's called contactless customer support. It's an AI-backed customer support system. It's a great example of being able to leverage everything that you have, but you need to renovate your tech system. And this is true, again, not just for the government. I appreciate that was the core of your question. But I think companies have also seen that because of anything, we've seen this surge in online activity. So what more should all of us be doing to renovate our infrastructure? Yeah. Um, I know we've also talked a lot in this conversation, not just about how to get women to the top, but also how to get people of color. I know that's a big concern of yours as well. Uh, obviously, Google has been in the headlines for um, Tim Net Gebru, uh, the former co-leader of your ethical AI team, saying she was fired after criticizing Google's approach to minority hiring and writing research about highlighting biases that may be built into AI technology. Your company obviously says she resigned. Um, without going to specifics on her case, I know that's tricky. Do you, are there any lessons learned here? Are there any ways that you think this situation could have been handled better or bigger picture going forward, uh, ways that your company can set a better tone uh, on, for its people of color workers? So it was clearly, clearly a painful situation for for all of us, and um, we're very committed to having people express voice and um, and, and in, you know engage constructively. It, it was complicated, but clearly a painful situation. I would say there are a couple of things that are key. One, um, we have, as many companies do, a number of employee um, affinity groups, resource groups. And our Black Googler network has been an extraordinary partner as we're making sure we're, we're understanding and hearing recommendations for what else we can be doing internally to really continue to raise the bar on ourselves and improve. Um, every element uh, of, of our programs, you know, one, one small one, but I think an example that we're looking at everything is we recently introduced something to support uh, repaying uh, student loans because we know uh, people of color are disproportionately burdened with student loans. So it's just, it's every element of it, but really engaging with the leadership there uh, is one important point. And the other, similarly, is what can we do in the external environment? So as an example, last week we announced um, we're, we're contributing $50 million to a group of uh, historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, to support scholarships and other, other requirements, other needs really to, again, just as with my comment on women, to help broaden the, the universe of talent that's coming into the field. So we're looking at what can we do internally and externally. It is a, a very, very high priority for us in all that we do. It's also reflected my comment on how are we looking at sites and site selection and talent growth. Uh, we have time for one more question, and I, I wanted to ask you this. You are a mother of three children. I know you said earlier you don't like that term work-life balance, but obviously so many parents, especially moms, feel like they're not doing enough at work, they're not doing enough at home, they're constantly feeling that stress. I believe your kids are, are now grown now, and I'm wondering what advice you give or would give to young parents, especially young moms who are in the middle of that really tough juggling act. What do you wish you had known? Well, the reason I don't like the term work-life balance is I think it's really hard to achieve. And so you always feel like you're failing and letting someone down. 
And I, that certainly was a big part of where I was. I wasn't doing enough for family, for work, for with my husband, friends. And I, so I, I went to this, this concept of work-life mix. It's like a kaleidoscope. You know, if you had two exact shapes, different colors, it's not going to be that interesting. But if it changes over time, sometimes you're more work, sometimes you're more with your kids, sometimes you need time for yourself, give yourself permission that it will change over time. Be there in the moments that, that matter, no question for your family, because those kids grow up really quickly. And give yourself permission to do what you need to do to support yourself. This is hard. There is not, what we all went through in COVID is really hard. And I think people need to permission themselves to know this was stressful. At Google, we introduced something called CARES Leave because we are very concerned about the wellness elements, the pressure of trying to juggle all these things. But at the core of your question, I would say just know the kids, they really do grow up quickly. I'm thrilled. I'm, I like I just, COVID was my opportunity to spend a lot of time with them, even though they're in their 20s. Cherish the moments and don't feel guilty because you're, you know, I think that my mom told me when I was a young kid, um, have a career, it's really important to have an identity beyond what you're doing at home. And I think they, you know, they appreciate and understand it. It's, and so I think that level of just permission yourselves, um, but don't miss these, don't miss this time. It goes by really quickly and take the time. It's fine. Technology enables you to work at home and integrate work and life in a way I most certainly didn't have when we had a computer room yet to work at as a young associate. And I think it's great that we have that level of flexibility and an awareness amongst you know people in leadership positions. It's gonna keep you more energetic. It's gonna keep you in the workplace longer. So we want it. I want, I want people to be able to take that time for themselves. I like that term work-life mix. Ruth, thank you so much for your time today and your insights. Thank you so much for your leadership on these important issues. It's great to be with you. We'll be right back with two former tech CEOs who happen to be daughters of single mothers. Stay tuned. When I was in high school, I got an academic award. We're at the ceremony and I'm walking up to get my award and my mom is sitting there and she says, represent. And I, as a kid, had no idea what she meant by that. And when I got to the stage, you know, and I'm looking around, I, I was the only black person up there. Oh. What she's saying is represent for the community, represent for black people, because you're the only one up there that looks like you. My name is Dr. Sierra Civils. I'm a nuclear engineer. You know, never in a million years, if you would have asked me back in high school if I would have been a nuclear engineer, I would have said, hell no. Um, take that out. <laughs> I'm originally from Chesapeake, Virginia. The school I went to was Hickory High School. It was kind of more predominantly white. My parents, you know, started to sit me down and say, okay, look, you're not like the other people in your class. You look different. People may make assumptions about you based on the way that you look. And as a kid, I didn't understand, you know, what they were trying to tell me. I kind of saw them as being dramatic. But over time, I started to realize, okay, they're preparing me for the world. As a minority, you're gonna have to work harder. That's the first thing I ever made when I went to MIT, and those people ate that lasagna, and I didn't even like it because it didn't have the 
Cooking is something that's really big in my family, and it's something that I felt like I was good at. It came natural to me. And at the time, you know, being a chef was the only thing that I really considered for a career, and something that I was really passionate about and never had any thoughts about doing anything else. Something that my parents pushed was having really good grades and making sure you did well in school. I was good in math and science, but I never saw it as an opportunity to have a career. And it wasn't until I took chemistry that my love for science really started to blossom. I was really interested in the atom, the periodic table, how these elements come together and create new things. In that chemistry class that really sparked my interest, um, my teacher, Mr. Harrell, he was the one to make that connection between chemistry and cooking and engineering for me. And you said, yeah, I'll probably just go to, you know, local college here or culinary school. I said, Sierra, <laughs> you're one of my best chemistry students. And he said, well, you should look into being a chemical engineer. Have you heard of that? Do you know what they do? And I was like, no. And he was like, go look it up and come back and tell me what you find. He was someone that challenged me. He was the first person to say, why don't you take an AP class? He didn't have to do that. But he saw something to where he was like, I feel like I can impact her career. And that's what he did. And so I would bring him different schools. And he would be like, that's a good school. But I think you can apply somewhere better. And when I looked at MIT, I was like, oh man, it's like six or 8% acceptance rate. Like, I don't think I'm ever gonna get in there. So when I brought that to Mr. Harrell, he was like, yeah, this is the kind of school that you should be applying to. I said, Harrell, you're the best. I will be sure to harass you next year and more years to come. And you kept your word. <laughs> you can you harass me anytime today. you want. Anytime you want. Oh, this is so crazy. It was a classmate that said, hey, didn't you apply to MIT? Like, um, did you check and see if you got in? And I was like, no, I'm going to go to VCU. And he was like, oh, well, you should just check. And so I went and I checked and I got in. And they were like, you got into MIT because of the demographics. And that stuck with me because I was like, well, what? What, are, what is it that they're saying about me? What are they saying about the institution? And, and that kind of pushed me to go because it was like, okay, well, you guys are mad that I got into MIT, so now I really got to go. MIT was the first time I really got challenged because that's the first time I failed a class. That's the first time I was making like C's and D's. So I just remember you always calling and being so upset and crying on the phone because you got a B at MIT. <laughs> I'd be like, you need to hang up and call Ma because I can't <laughs> understand what she's saying. So you didn't know that that was normal for you to not get straight A's, especially somewhere like that. I, that's what I was used to doing, so. Yeah, and it's not normal. <laughs> so after MIT, I went on to the University of Michigan and got my PhD in 2019. So I was the first black woman to get a PhD in nuclear engineering. I struggled with the idea of being the first because it was like, yes, I'm the first, I'm gonna open this door up for other people coming behind me, but I also was like, why did it take so long? How are they still the first black woman to do X? I think part of it, yes, is systemic racism. We weren't even allowed to go to an institution like MIT. When I was presented with the opportunity to go to a place like MIT, to go to a place like Michigan, I saw that as an opportunity to open the door for people that look like me to come in and be involved in this in these fields. And now I've arrived at Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, where I'm a nuclear engineer. I focus more on radiation simulations, specifically looking at how radiation affects materials. So when we irradiate something, how does that change the atom? How does it change its composition? How does it change its structure? When you look at rural communities or small towns or, or minority communities, th there's an issue of access, there's an issue of exposure. Things like uh, social media are ways that we can start to break down some of these barriers. So at MIT, one of the things that came to the forefront for me was that I was passionate about teaching and this idea of mentorship, this idea of inspiring the next generation showing them that people that look like them are out there in these fields. And we are trying to create 
a narrative and a community to show the next generation of STEM leaders that, hey, this is possible and it's fun. I tell kids that anything is possible. No goal or dream is too small. Each year we ask a student admitted to MIT to share with us the name of a teacher who has been especially influential in his or her development. It is a remarkable achievement and a great honor to change a life, so we congratulate you on being named this year by Sierra B. Sibbles. You do the work from which all of society benefits. Congratulations again on your excellent work. We at MIT are deeply grateful. Yeah, and they're not lying. You really you changed a life. Like, and I think that's the nice thing about being a mentor, because you encounter kids very early on in their career journey, and especially young black girls, and you open their eyes. Then they look at you and think, oh, if she can do that, I can do that. And my message to them is, yes, you can. Hello again, I'm Heather Long, an economics correspondent at the Washington Post, and we are talking about women in tech today. I am thrilled to be joined by two trailblazers, Stacy Brown Philpot, the former CEO of TaskRabbit, who is part of a neat initiative called the Opportunity Fund, and Jenny Rometty, the former CEO of IBM, who is now a senior advisor at Teneo. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny, let's start with you. We've been talking about these women in tech issues for years, for decades. You started in the industry 40 years ago, and we, while certainly some things are better, there's still a lot of challenges. How do you explain to people what are the top challenges that are still holding women back from getting these senior positions in tech today? Yes, well, you know, your comment about it's been over 40 years for me. So in tech that entire time. And if you do look at the numbers, Heather, like you just said, they speak for themselves that there has not been enough progress. And to me, there are just a number of systemic barriers that we could really make a difference on. Um, and they do start on one hand very early with uh, the exposure for girls and women to technology. But I think if I had to pick one that would make the biggest difference, it's to reposition for women in technology. What does it mean to even go into STEM? You know, people talk about STEM as if you're going to be an engineer. And when I say reposition it, and I think because in part you're addressing what from the very beginning is someone's own mindset about progressing in technology. And a repositioning would be think of going into STEM as a launch pad, not a destination because being in technology is just about problem solving. And frankly, that's problem solving is true in almost every industry. So number one, I'd work on just repositioning the qualifications. Therefore, it's a launch pad. If you actually practice and go to school for STEM, doesn't mean you have to be an engineer. But then the second thing is once you're in technology, to me, there's a very clear set of things to be addressed and they have to do with the authentic belief of why diversity and inclusion is important. The second is a whole set of things you can do around accountability, which I think have been missing across tech. And then the third would be just, you know, people ask for a silver bullet and having led IBM for such a long time, to me, it was never a silver bullet. It was consistent execution across many, many actions and raising the bar as frequently as I could on the topic. 
Yeah, that's really interesting what you were saying about that, uh, getting that pipeline, getting people interested even at a young age and realizing it's so much more than engineering. I, I, I want to follow up though. Um, obviously, we haven't made as much progress in this area as we want to. I, I got to ask you about quotas. You know, do you think that we're at a point where companies need to say, I want 40 or 50% of my management team to be female by 2025? Do they need to put an explicit goal in order to get there? You know, I have watched people react very negatively to the word quota. Um, and so put aside the word, you absolutely need targets for progress. There is no doubt in my mind. I have experienced this so many times throughout my career. I can, um, two things, two quick stories. It was 2002 when I acquired PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting. They were a consulting business. IBM had a consulting business. Um, if you looked at both, both fine companies, but the difference that values and beliefs in the importance on this makes, IBM probably had triple the women in the same business. That's just because being held accountable to that. I will fast forward. I can remember another time down in Brazil where I looked, I had no women executives. Well, I finally stopped hiring and said, you will not hire until this fixes itself. Guess what? It fixed itself. To this day, there are the most women executives there. And then as I became CEO, um, and you'll see it even in our proxy, there is a, a modifier to our compensation on progress across all diverse groups. And so I am a big believer that you do need, whether you want to call them quotas, targets, but companies need to be held accountable to hold themselves accountable to set of progress metrics, because otherwise this never does get fixed. And because there's a set of underlying barriers we can talk about. Yeah, I like that term, progress metrics, a, a nice way to put it. Uh, Stacy, I want to turn to you. You've been outspoken about your background growing up in Detroit, that you were often told to think about being in medicine or in law, and yet you went to work on Wall Street and then many years now in the tech space. I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Do you think uh, it's any easier for a young woman, particularly a young woman of color from Detroit today, to end up in Silicon Valley? You know, I like to think that it's easier. Jenny, I completely agree with you in that you accomplish what you measure. And I'd like to think that we've made so much progress, but when you said 40 years, I was like, wow, has it really been that long? And growing up in Detroit, there just weren't models of people who looked like me that were doing things in technology. The most successful people were doctors or lawyers. And so if you wanted to be successful, that was the model that you had. And so for me to go and study business at, a, at University of Pennsylvania at Wharton, and then to come out to this foreign place called Silicon Valley, which was foreign to me at the time, was highly unusual. But I always saw myself as a risk taker and also someone who looked around at my environment and figured out how to make it better. And so part of making it better was not just making the change, but being the change. And so I'm proud that now that there's people like me who are in tech and black women who are in tech that I don't even know yet, which is great. because I shouldn't know everybody who are setting the tone, who are setting the example for what this should look like. And so the pipeline is coming, the pipeline is building, but like all of us, we have to be the leaders that we want to see. So I have two little black girls, two daughters, and they're gonna have to be leaders in their own right too. They're gonna have to make changes and create change and make society, not just tech, what they want it to be as well. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. Um, I want to ask you, the Washington Post has written a number of stories, even in recent months, about some of the big tech companies hiring and this term that I'm sure you're familiar with, cultural fit, that so often people of color are being told that they've got great resumes, they've got qualifications, but they're not the right cultural fit for a big tech company. What does that really mean, that term in your eyes, and, and how can we get beyond that? It's such a, a loaded term, cultural fit. And what I try to do with TaskRabbit is create a culture where all voices are heard. In fact, it was part of our values as a company to encourage all voices. 
And so cultural fit is what the company is and who the people are that make up the company. And if that environment is not a diverse environment, if it's not an environment where people can come in and be their authentic selves, if it's not an environment where people can come in and express themselves and express all of who they are and bring all that they have to the workplace, then it's not a diverse environment and it's not a great place to work. And so to me, cultural fit is could be a great term, which is we embrace all cultures, we accept all people, we encourage all voices, and we want those voices to be heard. As a Black woman in tech, I certainly got into rooms and was the only or one of the only, and I was like, how do I fit in here? And it turns out that we are a lot more alike than we are different beyond just the, the same color blood running through our skin. Like, it really is a lot of similarities between who we are, even though our exteriors might look different. I've been fortunate to have some wonderful conversations with my friends who are Asian American, and we've had a lot of great discussions about our similar experiences and our different experiences, even though we come from different continents, or we may be both born in Detroit or both went to school in Pennsylvania. There's a lot of similarities there. And so to say that someone is not a cultural fit because we don't like the same video games. Well, maybe we like the same type of music, right? Music expands all races and backgrounds and generations, and there's a way to find it. So it's an excuse and a reason and not a good one, in my opinion. <clears throat> I want to ask you both this next one. Jenny, we can start with you and then Stacy, and want to get your thoughts. I'm curious to hear if you think this is a watershed moment in workplaces in America. And we've been writing a lot about this at the Post the past year, really changed everybody's lives. And when I talk to workers from all across the income spectrum, all, you know, different races, different backgrounds, I just hear the same thing over and over, that they, this really made me rethink what I want in my life, in my work, what I value, uh, where I want to work, how I want to work. And I, I'm curious, do you think this is a big watershed shed moment for American workplaces? Well, I do think it actually is, Heather, and I think it can be true on a couple different levels. And um, as I reflected back on the pandemic and the things I compared to myself, what I thought at the beginning to what I now think uh, today. And one of those thoughts has to do with um, if you take a look at what it is that people value. Um, trust obviously comes to the top now that it didn't before. The second thing is I think the pandemic showed us how fragile um, equality is actually. And so my hope of the many things that changes, I think one of them is something I've worked on the past decade. And so it's interesting for both Stacy and I to be on together. And it's about making the workforce in general, but in tech, much more inclusive of every different, not just gender, ethnicity, you name it across the board. Um, and when I say that what happened in the pandemic, obviously now to me, it has put a big spotlight, not just the pandemic, over what happened with the killing of George Floyd on black representation in these excellent jobs here. And it is clear to me um, for many different reasons, both tech has left the black community behind, but as well in general, you see whether there are good, good jobs that can be had right now without a four-year degree. And so, you know, it's one of the things I've, I'm very focused on, have been for a decade, by the way, and have very much proven that in tech in particular, there are many jobs you can have an excellent economic opportunity, the greatest equalizer, without a four-year degree, as an example. So I'm really hopeful it's a watershed moment to address what are some of the systemic barriers to getting more people great jobs with upward mobility in the digital era. And I think this is the beginning. I've wanted it to be a movement for 10 years. I've worked on this for 10 years. I mean, today IBM's hiring 15% are people that do not have college degrees or PhDs, all diverse, 90% Black and Hispanic. And that was not true. A decade ago, 100% PhDs and four-year degrees. Now, this isn't saying those aren't valuable. To me, it's giving people an on-ramp into this industry that's earlier and it's different because of whatever set of circumstances. It has nothing to do with aptitude. And so it is just about access. 
And so I, as you know, I'm involved in something called 110, which is all the big companies in this country making commitment to hire 1 million black employees over the next 10 years without four-year degrees to get started, but into family-sustaining jobs with upward mobility, all based on removing this structural barrier that says you have to have a four-year degree to get started. So one of the ways to make the workplace far more inclusive is by removing barriers. And by the way, that barrier exists not just for the black community, it is for the, if you take a look at the Hispanic, many different communities. Um, and this is to me, I think it's one of my greatest hopes when you say it's a watershed moment, that this remains a movement, that it's action, it's not words that really change something. Stacy, how about you? What are you seeing? Yeah, I, well, I think the last year or more now, I guess, we're <laughs> past the year mark here, has really taught us a few things. One is just empathy. My kids running in the background, other people's babies crying, everything on Zoom. I mean, the empathy that we've had to develop in order to make it through what we've gone through, but also understand that work and life just really can't be separate anymore is a, is a real thing. And I think that's important thing to carry forward. The other is that essential. What is the definition of essential? And there were plenty of things that we knew were essential, but there were some things that we didn't realize were essential. TaskRabbit's business remained open. We provided our taskers with the right types of equipment to go in and safely provide tasks. But we did that because it was essential that people had a way to make a living and a way to work. And so when we talk about the gig economy and think about the gig economy, it wasn't just this sort of thing that happened on the side. It became an essential way for you to get your prescriptions and your medicine and your office desk set up because you now have to work from home for the next year. The last thing that I think that really came out, and I'm not sure it's watershed because it feels like that's temporary, but there's been a real rise for action and for change that we've not seen and I've never seen in my life. And my mother who lived through the civil rights movement did not and has not ever seen. And the culmination of that is a lot about what Jenny was talking about, but it's also about recognizing that we've got talent, black talent just out there that exists that we've under invested in already. And that's why I started the Opportunity Fund with my two friends, Marcelo and Paul. We were just talking about what could we do? What more could we do beyond what we've accomplished today? And it was the creation of the Opportunity Fund. We know that there are great founders out there who haven't had the opportunity to raise capital, who were told that they didn't have the cultural fit or whatever fit they needed to raise money from a traditional VC. And so to date, in just a year, we've invested in over 50 companies, over $50 million in those businesses, and they cut across all tech tech sectors in tech from enterprise SaaS business, AR, VR, HR, consumer marketplaces, just about everything. And so the talent is out there and there's an opportunity to invest in that talent. And so I think we're at a new plateau and the sustained momentum will continue. Wow, both very powerful answers. Stacey, I want to pick up on that last point, this opportunity fund, I believe it's $100 million, and you've said you've already invested half of it, which is remarkable. Uh, why aren't uh, people of color, companies founded by people of color, you know, getting these venture capital investments, and how much of a game changer are you hoping that this opportunity fund is in that space? It's so, as someone who sat across the table and raised capital before, I know how hard it is just to raise the money. But to go in and not have somebody on the other side of the table who can relate to you, who can understand your story, makes it that much harder. And I believe that what we need is not just one SoftBank Opportunity Fund. We need many Black, African-American VCs out there across the table who can relate. And by relating, I mean, the story of me growing up in Detroit was about grit and perseverance that we all try to teach our kids and we want them to read in the books. That was my life. I learned how to do it. I learned how to hustle. I learned how to figure those things out. And it's, it's hard to relate to that if that was not your lived experience. And so part of the challenge that we have is that the people who are in charge of the money 
don't have the lived experiences, and they many times can't relate. So with the Soft Bank Opportunity Fund, the investment committee is Black, Latinx people who understand and can re and relate. The team is another 12 people, so there's 15 of us total, who can understand and relate. And by being able to relate, we can sit across from a founder and know how hard it was for them to leave that cushy job as a you know person who worked at Facebook or who worked at Google and start a company when all their parents wanted for their whole life was for them to get a job at Facebook or at Google. And now they're basically trying to raise $2 million to start something that could become a billion dollar business someday. When we get to a world where the face of wealth creation reflects society, is more diverse, then it'll be much easier for people who look like me to raise capital. Well said. Jenny, I want to ask you, uh, you, know, you, I know you and I have talked before about the P-TECH program, those pathways for people to do something more like an associate's degree, to go from high school into tech jobs. Uh, I'm curious to get your take, though, about a big issue that's come up. Um, do, do you think these unemployment benefits are holding people back from work, from, from returning to work right now? Well, anything uh, I see, I, it is anecdotal, but I do know that every corner I go to, every store, every small city, even big, everyone's looking for people to work right now. And so that is to me, you've got to ask yourself a question, is that one reason then why people are not yet returning to the workforce? Now, we will see some of that come the fall, I think, or as some of the benefits stop, we'll see if that does then increase the number of people out in for jobs. But I think, you know, what we're also going to see is this broader point about have, has the pandemic now caused a whole generation of women to be left behind? And, you know, early on, I was really worried about this point. I was watching that many of the women, because children not being in school, um, of course, there's very helpful fathers out there, so don't misinterpret my comments, but much of the caregiving often fell to the women. And I watched a number of women in our own company decide, you know, not to come back to work. They had to stay with children. And so I think between that issue of childcare and schools and the whole year being closed, how fast now these women come back into the workforce, as well, many of the service uh, jobs and the service economy that were out there that um, either have gone away or are very different, I think we're going to have this different issue. So not just is it holding back, I think it's about how do we go forward and do we are we sure we don't set back in a number, whether it's gender, as which much of this discussion is about, to pull women back in. Because at the core, one thing I do worry about, and I'm going to generalize something with women, and it was something I learned early on, and it was a piece of, if you ask me only my one piece of valuable advice to people, it was that growth and comfort never coexist. And I saw this over and over in myself and in women that when change happens and you have to take a risk, Stacy's taken risks, we've all taken big risks, you are very uncomfortable. And you've got to get really comfortable that growth happens only when you are at risk. And I bring that saying up, growth and comfort never coexist because now you have so many people changing jobs and women returning back and maybe into different roles. And so that to me has never been a, this has never been a more acute moment for that kind of advice or lesson that growth and comfort will never coexist, that we've got to pull back, not who's out of the workforce, but how we pull back into the workforce and integrate jobs. Yeah, that's a good point. Certainly the numbers are looking more encouraging lately for women, and hopefully that will continue this summer and into the fall. Uh, Stacy, uh, I wanna go back to you and, and um, you know, you're such a good thinker about the future of technology and what's coming down the pipeline. You were obviously heavily involved in the gig economy as part of TaskRabbit. And I'm curious what trend or two you think is going to be key in the next, let's say, 10 years. I know it all changes so fast in tech, but what should people be watching for and focused on in the tech space? Yeah, I think there's so much opportunity out there. And I sit on the board of, of HP and Nordstrom and, and Noom. And with all of those companies, I have had the pleasure of seeing technology and how technology will change people's lives. For example, with Noom, this is a company that's really focused on creating better health outcomes for people. And if, if we learn nothing in the last year, we know that our health is important in many cases, the consumer experience around health care 
is not great. And so we need great companies who are going to use technology to not just create better medical devices, but also create better experiences for consumers. There's a great company that the Opportunity Fund is invested in, called Vitable, that is doing that and providing home care experiences for the underinsured. Cybersecurity. All of us working from home have figured out that, you know, we have to now protect and create an environment where our information is safe. And sitting on the board of HP has really shown me that it's not just about the devices. And I certainly am happy that I have my printer and my screens and my monitor and everything here. But how do we now extend what was a protected, private, safe environment at work, at home, or in a hybrid environment? Because many of us know that we're not going to go back to the work the way that we used to work. And then, of course, the future of retail is, is ripe for disruption. That was an industry much like travel that really was hurt last year. And I always look at like something bad happening as an opportunity to create great businesses and create great companies. And in retail, it's, all, it's always going to be about commerce and creating a great experience and leveraging technology in particular AI. And I know we've been talking about AI forever, but how do we create a truly great personalized experiences that's driven by content and community to really drive commerce. I think there's some wonderful tech opportunities out there for that. Uh, we're almost out of time, but Ginny, I just wanted to pick up on Stacy's great point on cybersecurity. We've heard some officials say, warn that we are on the cusp of a global digital pandemic because of all these cybersecurity threats. i just curious really quickly if you agree with that. Well, look, I, I agree it's one of the very top issues in technology to be addressed and that uh, having done, dealt in this area for decades and having built a huge cyber business, while we can talk about all the advancements, I will back up though, and I will tell you one thing, Heather, it does boil back down to at an individual level, um, refocusing on the basics of what each one of us does every day uh, to protect ourselves. And yes, there will be the most extreme that uh, happens at the other end, but I guarantee you most of the, much of damage happens because of what we individually choose or not choose to do to protect so it's really the basics and then I go back to the other side and then it's all about AI deployment on this. This is not a, a manual war. This is going to be technology versus technology. So it is very real, but it is interestingly fought on two ends. The most extreme end with technology versus technology and then the other end is on human behavior. Thank you so much to you both, Jenny Rometty and Stacy Brown Philpot. Great insights today. And I really enjoyed that you both stress and emphasize the importance of taking risk in your career and stretching yourself as much as possible. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Please join us at Washington Post Live later today at 3 p.m. Eastern time for a fascinating conversation with the head of Navajo Nation, the Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez. You can catch other events on WashingtonPostLive.com.